this exhibition um, tells the story of these and reunites two masterpieces of early Netherlandish painting. Uh, as it, at its anchor uh, is the, a painting from the Frick collection, which I wanted to uh, put a bit more forward. Uh, it's one of uh, the Frick, I think, overlooks gem. And the painting is uh, the, Venin the Virgin and Child with St. Elizabeth, uh, St. Barbara, and Jan Vos. Uh, it was painted by Jan van Eyck probably around 1441 um, and commissioned from him and com completed by his workshop and was commissioned by this monk uh, Jan Vos who was uh, the prior of the Charter House of Bruges that is the uh, the leading the, the head of uh, the Charter House Charter Houses were monasteries of the Carthusian order and this man Jan Vos commissioned another panel which now lives in uh, Berlin's Gemälde Gallery a uh, lovely, beautiful uh, little panel by Petrus Christus, uh, which has a very, very closely uh, related iconography. It depicts, again, the Virgin and Child with Jan Vos kneeling as a donor introduced by St. Barbara. And these two paintings had only been seen uh, once together before in 1994, here in New York as well, as a matter of fact, in the exhibition that Marion Ainsworth put together uh, at the Metropolitan Museum. It was the first monographic show about Christus, and then the, her project was revolved around settling issues of attribution around our painting, which had been attributed to Van Eyck and uh, Christus as a collaborative work. And Marion, um, through technical examination and comparison with other works, showed that Christus actually had nothing to do with our painting and that our painting was Van Eyck and Workshop. So going beyond issues of uh, pure attribution, what I wanted to do with this show is to uh, put the picture in its broader kind of monastic context and probe issues of how these uh, objects were used, viewed, and valued by um, by their medieval viewers at the time. And so it's a, it's a show about patronage and about reception of works of art. And, and so in order to do that, I brought other works I tracked down from uh, either that are, were directly connected to the Bruce Charter House or uh, that were uh, connected to the Carthusian order in general. And uh, yeah, something that intrigued me from the start was that actually Vos was a monk from the uh, Carthusian order, which was a very, very austere monastic order at the time. Its monks lived in complete solitude and silence and um, were, had an ambivalent relationship with images on the basis of their austerity. They were a bit suspicious of images. So I wondered, there was a tension that I wanted to explore between this austerity and the visual splendor that we see in the works of art that Vos commissioned. So the painting was probably commissioned when um, Jan Vos moved from Utrecht, where he spent his earlier career in the 1430s, to Bruges in 1441, when he's elected, probably in the first days of April 41, uh, as head of the Bruges Charter House. Um, in my paper during the um, symposium, during the workshop, I talked about the fact that actually uh, Utrecht was an early and key center in the early reception of Van Eyck's art, and I wonder if that could not have um, conditioned his taste. And so basically when he moves to, um, to Bruges, he goes to Van Eyck and get, to get the real thing. And um, the thing is, Van Eyck, we know, dies um, before June 30, 23rd that year of 41. So basically leaving us, you know, something like three months for Van Eyck to do any work on the painting. And so the assumption is that Van Eyck may have com started work on the painting, and that's something that uh, we looked at with Marion Ainsworth, thanks to uh, her collaboration and that of amazing colleagues at the Met, uh, led by uh, Sophie Scully in the Conservation Department. We've been able, last in the summer of 2017, to uh, bring uh, the Frick painting to the Met uh, Conservation um, Department and um, do new infrared reflectography on the, uh, on the panel. And what we found out are underdrawings that are extremely consistent with what we know of underdrawings um, by in o works that are autographed by Van Eyck. Um, so that has led uh, Marion, I mean, Marion showed these uh, findings in her um, wonderful essay for the catalog that. Um, that has led to a narrative where basically Van Eyck starts work on the painting, lays down the composition, 
and then it's executed by a member of the workshop who is somewhat simplifies sometimes the, uh, the, the he, he can't face up to the challenges that are uh, set in the underdrawing, so he simplifies or adds his little flourish and it doesn't always make sense. So uh, that is quite, it's very interesting in terms of um, uh, the insight it gives us into the um, um, artistic process of a big uh, Renaissance workshop at the time, as well as um, kind of giving us a, a finer understanding of the continuation of uh, the Van Eyck workshop after the master's death, because the assumption is that it would have been made, uh, I mean, completed after Van Eyck dies. Unfortunately, both the Bruges Charterhouse and the Charterhouse of Utrecht, where uh, the painting is taken after Jan Vos leaves, leaves Bruges, Jan Vos leaves, um, stays in Bruges from 1441 until 1450, when he's called back to his original Charterhouse of Utrecht uh, to become the prior there. And he, um, he leaves the Charterhouse for another eight years before retiring, and he dies in 1462. At this point, uh, the, the the painting is is there with him and stays there, but the both the both the charter houses are destroyed during the religious wars that uh, swept through the. Uh, um, the Flanders and, and the Northern Netherlands at the time. So in 1580, the Charter House of Utrecht is destroyed. And at this point, we lose complete trace of the painting. And, in, and it only pops up. We don't know how it survived. We, it only pops up in the collection of James de Rothschild in Paris. Um, James de Rothschild is the founder of the French branch of the Rothschild Bank uh, in Paris in the early 19th century. And so the painting is first documented in 1836 in his collection. And we know something new, new evidence that um, um, I published in the catalog for the first time is that he actually, um, James de Rothschild, um, sw uh, swapped the painting against a painting by Karel Dujardin, who was a Dutch Golden Age painter. And so it's a really interesting thing because um, exchanging a Van Eyck uh, for a Golden Age painting is not something you would do. It was actually quite um, um, quite unusual to do at the time. Uh, the, the early Netherlands painting, especially in Paris, did not have a great artistic currency. So here we really see, uh, you know, the Rothschild as again pioneering uh, in their taste and really discriminate because indeed in a market that was still uh, riddled with copies or with the, just a budding understanding of what early Netherlands painting is at this point, he manages to get this, uh, you know, really, really fine work, along with um, other panels by, uh, this panel by Memling, that's now in the Louvre, for instance, so really, really, um, really good, um, really good at, at his acquisitions and, and quite pioneering in his tastes. And then the painting uh, was uh, remains in the family, the Rothschild family, in Paris until uh, 1954, when it is acquired by the Frick for quite an important sum at the time, eight eight hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. Directly from the Rothschild uh, to, uh, to by the Frick, and this was done upon the um, quite energetic. Uh, um, impulse of Helen Clay Frick, who was the daughter of uh, our founder, Henry Clay Frick, and who was um, of a strong proponent of buying the earlier school. So she she developed the early Italian collection at the Frick. Most of the pictures you see uh, by early Italian and Renaissance artists uh, were purchased uh, under her leadership somehow. And the same applies for, for our, our painting. So. So one of the questions that were uh, very important to me as part of this exhibition was to figure out the function that the, the Frick uh, Virgin served for its uh, Carthusian uh, patron and viewers. Um, while the function of the Exeter Virgin was always very clear on account of its small size, clearly an object meant to be held up close, used during meditation uh, inside uh, the monk's cell, uh, the, paint, uh, the Frick Virgin had alternatively been called a an altarpiece, it's 
bit small for that, and a devotional work. And on the other hand, it's a bit big for that. So um, I, w- I wanted to, to clarify that issue. And while doing research, and based on the um, kind of type of ev- archival evidence we have, I venture in uh, the catalog that our painting was an altogether third type of object um, that has gained um, renewed scholarly uh, attention in recent years uh, that is called a memorial or an epitaph. These were uh, relatively large scale tablets that could be either painted or sculpted that usually incorporated the effigy of a deceased donor, such as the way Jan Vos appears in the painting, introduced by saints to holy figures whose intercession they sought, such as most of the cases, uh, the virgin and child. So that's visually, that's exactly what we have in our painting. And on the frames, these um, tablets, these memorials, would bear the, an, in, an inscription that identified the deceased donor and begged or petitioned um, viewers for uh, prayers for the repose of their souls, which was very, very important at the time because um, people believed that prayers from the living were the most uh, secure way to ensure the salvation of the dead and a shortening of their time in purgatory. So these would be placed in the church and, you know, try to uh, petition uh, people to uh, for suffrages. Um, so that was, I think, the function of, of the work, so something very, very commemorative. Um, as to the indulgence once we know it's a, it's a memorial, it makes more sense that it would have been indulgence somehow. Um, I found in the archive, we knew of the indulgence. The, the f- in 1443, Jan Vos asks a passing bishop, a friend of his, who's passing through Bruges, to uh, a friend or an acquaintance of his at least, uh, to grant uh, 40 days of indulgence to his painting, which means that every time a viewer would say the Ave Maria in front of the Virgin, the prayer of which actually incidentally appears embroidered in the canopy behind the Virgin, then the viewer would get 40 days of purgatory. Um, and so basically, the, this indulgence creates a kind of a win-win situation, a tr- mutually beneficial. His praying in front of the memorial would benefit both his soul as well as that of um, the viewer, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. So it's a way uh, to make sure that people engage with the object, and I think there is it, an anxiety with Vos about his object being uh, gradually forgotten and making sure that people keep on uh, engaging with the, the memorial and keep on praying to it. Uh, and, you know, praying the, the indulgence prayers, uh, reciting them, the Ave Maria, the Pater Noster, but also praying prayers for his own soul. So uh, I think that's what uh, was about. And basically what I found that we didn't know before was that he asked for the indulgence himself. We knew there was an indulgence, but I found out that it was granted at his express request, which uh, shows his agency in trying to um, establish a form of strategy for eternity and making the panel a sort of currency in the economy of salvation that pervaded the era. So we have a really uh, wide and interesting array of objects in addition to the two panel paintings that form the center of the exhibition. Um, we ha- the, the Albertina in Vienna has been generous enough to lend us a wonderful drawing uh, that we attri- has been attributed to Petrus Christus that records a lost uh, work by Van Eyck which clearly informed uh, the composition of uh, the Exeter Virgin and the Frick Virgin too, to an extent. So that's uh, really, that offers a really interesting insight into the creative process um, of these paintings. We also have um, a wonderful portrait from the Metropolitan Museum uh, by Petrus Christus, which is signed and dated 1446, that is the middle of Jan Vos's tenure as prior of the Charter House of Bruges. And it's really, um, Kind of exemplifies the strong links that ties the, um, the 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 monastery and these artists at that time, and really kind of puts a spotlight on the monastery as an overlooked artistic hub for the period, and uh, it depicts an, a monk we. Who, who, whose name has been lost, but who is wearing the Carthusian habit and kind of looks very confidently and quizzically at the viewer. Um, also in the show is... Um, 
to, I mean, I wanted to show the, t um, the kind of broader visual culture of um, the Carthusians at the time. Today, paintings has primacy over other media, but at the time, this, you know, this wasn't the case. So I brought uh, other uh, types of objects. I tracked down a gradual, uh, that is a songbook used during mass. Um, it is the only um, manuscript uh, that is illustrated and that survives for the late medieval period uh, at the Charterhouse of Bruce, so we're lucky to have it. It is quite beaten up, uh, having been, it shows extensive signs of use, but that in itself was very interesting to me because it shows how basically these objects were indeed uh, intended to be used and engaged with and interacted with physically. It shows um, its illustrations are very abraded and worn from generations of monks uh, touching and kissing the holy images while using the book. So kissing the image of the Virgin and, you know, this kind of very physical engagement, which I think is interesting to, to put forward and tells us a lot about actually devotional practices in, in this monastic context. Uh, we also have a wonderful uh, prayer bead, which is um, a form of uh, micro carving made of, of boxwood uh, that uh, could be um, open up to reveal, again, a world of detail and uh, minute uh, figures. And in this case, it shows um, the head of the order in the early 16th century, a man called François Dupuis, depicted kneeling and introduced by Saint Bruno, the founder of the order, to the Virgin and Child on the other hemisphere. And it's an amazingly um, finely carved uh, object that also shows um, you know, this very kind of, again, intimate, something you open that you look at uh, with great attention. And uh, all these objects actually command uh, and require the viewer to look actively, to look um, and take time. It's, it's something you need to uh, take in. And this type of active looking, I think, uh, is uh, quite nice to put forward at a time where people, you know, were flushed by images through Instagram and used to swipe and scroll. These actually uh, require some effort, but I think these efforts are very uh, are rewarded once you, you really engage. Uh, and we have uh, also something quite exceptional in the show is a clay tablet that has come to us from Utrecht. Vos um, is n associated with, uh, we know that he probably owned one such object, and at first I didn't know what those tablets were, but they are a, a production that um, are actually vernacular to Utrecht. They were, there was a vibrant tradition of making devotional objects out of a local type of clay that is called uh, pipe clay, which has the characteristic of turning white upon heating. And uh, the tablet we have is the only one that survives these, uh, most of them from, from Utrecht. Most of them have been destroyed during the Reformation, so we're really lucky to have it. There's none in the U.S. It's this kind of terracotta from the north. So it's quite uh, an exceptional loan that we have had from the Catarine convent in Utrecht.